Today, we're going to be very precise about how time-restricted feeding, it's very clear from both animal studies and human studies, can have a very powerful and positive impact on everything from weight loss and fat loss to various health parameters. So it turns out that the answer to the question, when is it best to eat, is actually best answered by thinking about the other side of the coin, which is when is it best to fast. So because we are fasting during sleep, it's very clear that it's best to extend the sleep-related fast either into the morning or to start it in the evening. Now, this might seem kind of obvious, but it's actually not so obvious. You could place that feeding window early in the day, middle of the day, or late in the day. So you're already fasting when you're asleep and how deep you are into that fast depends on how long it was since your last meal. So if you fast early in the day and you've been asleep for five, six, seven, eight hours, I would hope somewhere between six and eight hours for most people is going to be beneficial. When you wake up, I mentioned earlier that you don't want to eat for at least the first 60 minutes after waking, but were you to extend that fasting to say 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., or even 12 noon or later, you are taking advantage of the deep fast that you were in during sleep and certainly toward the end of sleep. Now, why do I say deep fast? Well, because when we eat, the clearance of that food from our gut and the processes in our cells and organs that are related to digestion and the utilization of that food takes about five to six hours. So if you eat a meal and that meal lasts 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes, or even an hour, and then you stop eating, you've stopped eating, but you are not fasting at that point. You can say you're fasting because you're no longer putting food into your digestive tract, but you are not in a fasted state. You are not under conditions of fasting. So one thing is certain that you want your eating window to be tacked or attached to your sleep-based fasting in a way that makes it easier for you to get into the fasted state for a period of time. Can you not eat until 2 p.m.? Drink coffee, drink water, and in the morning, get up and just get on either run or get on some exercise bike and just pedal like someone's chasing you with a syringe full of poison. When you've been asleep all night, your fuel reserves, you got fuel in your fat, you've got fuel in your muscles that can be burned and you've got fuel in your liver. It's called glycogen. And when you wake up early, all of that is as low as it's going to be because you haven't been eating anything. Got you. And so if you exercise, then your body starts dropping into your body fat stores quicker. Let's talk about movement and the more traditional kinds of movement, aka exercise, has been shown to lead to increases in metabolism and fat loss to greater degrees depending on whether or not, for instance, you're fasted when you do it or not, whether or not you do your cardio first or your resistance training first. And this is, again, in a literature for which there's a lot of controversy, but in digging through all the studies on, on this, we're finally starting to arrive at a consensus of when is best to do exercise and what types of exercise to do if your goal is fat loss. So rather than think about weight training versus cardiovascular exercise, I think the most simple way, the most fluid way to have this conversation about about exercise and fat loss is in terms of three general types of training. And those are high intensity interval training, sprint interval training. So that's going to be very high intensity or SIT or moderate intensity continuous training, M-I-C-T. So we've got HIT, SIT and MICT, M-I-C-T. SIT, this uh, sprint interval training was defined as all out greater than 100% of VO2 max bursts of activity that last eight to 30 seconds interspersed with less intense recovery periods. So this would be sprinting downfield for eight to 30 seconds, then maybe walking back for about a minute or two and then sprinting again and then continuing. So that would be SIT. HIT, H-I-I-T, is defined as submaximal, so 80 to 100% of VO2 max bursts of activity that last 60 to 240 seconds interspersed with less intense recovery periods. So on a four, standard 400 meter track, just to give this a little bit of a visual, um, you know, one a four minute mile would be fantastic for most people, although people run faster than that, of course. So that's four 60 second laps, but that's back to back to back. But 60 seconds would be about one rev revolution around the track, maybe maybe 90 seconds, depending on how fast uh, one is running. So 60 to 240 seconds. MICT, okay, this moderate intensity continuous training is steady state cardio, sometimes called zone two cardio these days on the internet, which is performed continuously for 20 to 60 minutes at moderate intensity of 40 to 60% of VO2 max, or if you prefer heart rate, 55 to 70% of max heart rate. So we can think about high, medium, and low intensity exercise 
exercise. Although low intensity um, usually means that you could carry on a conversation or maybe you'd have to gasp every every few steps or so while trying to talk and run. That's, I think, uh, going to be the most useful way to have this conversation that we're having now because there's so many different forms of exercise that people do and intensity is important. Let's ask the question that I think many of people are wondering about, which is, will you burn more fat if you exercise without in eating anything first, without ingesting any calories first? It's been shown that at least for short periods of training, it doesn't really seem to matter whether or not you eat before training or you don't if your goal is fat oxidation. Now, I want to put an asterisk near that because there's some exceptions, but you can find a number of examples where eating before exercise reduces the amount of fat that's oxidized during the exercise. And you can also find a lot of studies showing that eating during exercise will, or prior to exercise, will not reduce the amount of fat that's oxidized. However, the types of exercise, whether or not it was medium intensity or high intensity or low intensity, is all over the map for these studies. So it's very hard to target an ideal protocol. And then if you look really deep in the literature, you start to find meta-analyses where people have actually aggregated all the findings and some modern studies where it points to some very specific and useful protocols. And so here's the rule that, or the protocol that I extracted from that literature at about or after 90 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. There's a switchover point whereby if you ate before the exercise, I mean, you will burn far less fat from the 90 minute point onward than you would if you had gone into the training fast. If you happen to have eaten before the exercise within one to three hours prior to the exercise, then you reduce the amount of fat that you will burn from 90 minutes onward. Whereas if you had fasted prior to the exercise, you hadn't eaten anything for three hours or more prior to the exercise, at the 90 minute point, you will start to burn more fat than you would had you eaten. Now, 90 minutes of moderate intensity exercise is a lot. So that's a that's a pretty long run. Even if you're running at a pretty slow pace, like a 10 or 12 minute mile, that's a lot of running. That's a lot of swimming. So that's a lot of walking. That's a lot of hiking. However, there are people who are going out hiking all day or running all day or walking all day. And if you want to burn more fat per unit time, you want to oxidize more fat, then you would do that fasted. 